were able to take communion this morning and really kind of, I, I know it's a, a bit rushed, it's a different than we've done it a lot of times, you're trying to fumble with this little plastic cup, and I get it, uh, but I hope you don't miss the point, and that is to commune with God briefly, just to sort of confess the things that are going on in your life, and to sort of reacquaint yourself with the Holy Spirit, and ask God's uh, guidance and wisdom in your life, and of course, it also causes us to want to think about uh, relationships and good ones and ones that could be better and who do we need to approach to make that happen. And uh, I, I, always, I always just marvel at, at communion. It just causes me to slow down and really take stock of where I am with the Lord, even in a setting like this where it's rushed. And, and if you've been in the church very long, you know sometimes this happens. We have done communion here in many different ways and many different times. And um, I remember doing youth ministry and doing communion camps around a campfire. And it was uh, one of those cases where we did the Coke and the goldfish. You know, we had, we had what we had and we used what we used. Yeah, may, maybe I should get a different mic or something. This doesn't seem to be working so well. Okay. Is this one better? Okay, good. So I, I just hope you were able to take that time, just that short moment, to sort of say, Lord, you know, cast aside all these other things. I really want to focus on you this morning and focus on our relationship together. Um, we're continuing in our series. We're in the book of Acts, and we're looking at sermons in the book of Acts. And uh, the idea there is this proclamation of the gospel. We've worked really from the beginning of the year right up to Easter, where we get to a place where we, we enjoy the resurrection, we rejoice in it, right? We're excited about it. And what happened to the church after, after the resurrection of Christ? What did they do when he was raised from the dead? And Scripture tells us others were even shaken and raised from the dead from their, from their tombs. And then eventually, uh, 50 days later, 30 days later, the Lord ascended into heaven. So the church was left. What does the church do? Well, they proclaimed the gospel. And so this morning we're going to look at another one of the sermons that was preached during that time and what occurred during that, that preaching of, of that particular sermon. And it's, it's significant because I think what it speaks to, if you uh, have your Bibles, you can go there. It's in Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at the first 14 verses or so. We're going to skim right through those. But, but as we look at them, the story that unfolds in those 14 verses, as I read it, is a story of courage. Now, courage takes many forms. How many of you have a phobia of some sort? Raise your hand if you have a phobia. You're, you have a fear of something, right? Yeah, there's almost all of us, uh, even some of us have a fear of raising our hands in public. And so I get that. I get that. Uh, how many of you fear spiders? Oh, yeah, now, we're, yeah, okay, now the hands go up. Uh, some people fear heights. Do we have anybody that fears heights? I've got a few of those in my family, people that refuse to fly on airplanes because... They fear heights. They don't like being out of control. I, I have no fears, except uh, as I've gotten older, I've discovered one fear that I didn't have when I was younger, and that is uh, I'm a bit claustrophobic. Uh, one of the things that terrifies me the most is when my zipper gets stuck on my jacket, and you can't get out of the jacket, and the zipper, and you're going, ah, rah, rah. I, I, could, I would rip a jacket apart to get out of a jacket. And I, I haven't had any strange phobic dreams or anything, but my, my greatest fear is being put in a, a, like a, a sleeping bag or something where I can't move. And it's never happened, but, but I have this horrible fear that it's going to someday. And so, I don't know, I guess claustrophobia would be the closest thing to that. We all have fears. They say the greatest fear is for people to get up and speak in public. That's one I've never had, but... But for most people, a lot of people anyway, that's a big fear. And we're looking at this particular passage today, and, and it speaks to the idea of getting up and preaching. I don't know what your preaching looks like. Everybody's preaching is different in their life. Some of you only preach to your family around the table. Some of you preach at work, you know, and some of you do it by your actions, and some of, it, some of you do it with your words. But we all, as believers, have a testimony and and the ability to, to preach to people around us. And so consequently, um, we, we, we want to make sure that our message gets through. And to preach to those around us 
takes a lot of courage. Sometimes you're preaching to an audience that you have a strategy for. Maybe it's somebody that you golf with on a regular basis or you, you are in a club and you, there's somebody there, right, who, who you're saying to yourself, well, they're not going to come to Christ today, but if I continue my message, someday it's going to happen. And I'm going to pray like God's in, in it with me in this plan, and, and it's going to happen. Maybe, maybe somebody in your family. It could be somebody you work with. Or maybe they're the people that you only come across once in a while, right? Uh, waiters and waitresses or, or uh, people that you, you just bump into in public and you want to share the gospel with them. There's no strategy, really. You don't necessarily even know them, but you want to get the gospel out there, right? Maybe it's a neighbor you, you only talk to once in a while or somebody that you come across at work that you only see once in a while and, and you don't necessarily have a strategy for them. But the idea is, you want everybody around you to hear the gospel. So how do you preach? I, I get Sunday mornings. I have dibs on that. But, but we all have the opportunity, right, to share the gospel with those around us. So don't mistake the great sermons in, in Acts as something that's for somebody else. Just take the general principles that you see here and apply them to what you're doing. Because in today's sermon that we're going to be talking about here in chapter 4, as I read it, the greatest thing was the courage that was displayed. And it takes courage to be able to preach the gospel. The same kind of courage, maybe even greater courage, than to overcome a spider, or to overcome heights, or to overcome claustrophobia. It takes great courage to set the gospel out there. Because you're setting yourself up for rejection. You're setting yourself up for uh, somebody to unfriend you. You're setting yourself up for lots of things that you probably make you feel uncomfortable. But here in the book of Acts, we see a group of people who were willing to preach, in this case, Peter, willing to preach. It didn't matter that it made him uncomfortable. It didn't matter he might be unfriended in social media. He was determined that those around him would know the gospel. So we're going to examine that. First, we're going to read it. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and stand up. And uh, in honor of God's word, we'll read it together. It'll be on the screen, but we'll also have it right here in front of me, and I'll read it. You can follow along. And this is what it says in Acts chapter 4, uh, 1 through 14. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do these things? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by him... This man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is, it, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Father, thank you for uh, the early church. Thank you for the sermons of Peter and others in the book of Acts that we can grasp from them the concept of what it means to be bold in our faith. And today as we examine their their time before the leaders of Israel, as we examine how they spoke to power, Lord, help us to be those who are willing to do the same. Father, we 
love you. We ask that your word would pierce our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so go ahead and have a seat. And this is the background of the story. The man was healed. They're talking about this man to all of the people who would listen. As you saw in the text, it may be 5,000 men, which doesn't account for the women who were there and families that were there, came to know Christ as a result of the preaching and teaching of Peter in the early part of the book of Acts. And there's this healed man standing there, and Peter is talking about the miracles that Jesus did and the power by which this man was healed. And, of course, the problem was uh, the people that came out to see him were the leaders. The, we, would, we would call it the Sanhedrin, those who were in charge of Israel in a governmental sense. And here we have, uh, the, he's sort of calling them out. He says, the, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were really upset because you see right after that, he says he, they were greatly annoyed because he had been teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees was one of those groups that just believed that when you died, it, it was sort of nihilistic. It was ni nihilism is what we would call it today. And that is that when you die, it's just over. There's nothing. There's nothing there. And so that's why they were so sad, you see. They did not believe in the resurrection. So Jesus, or that Peter is out there preaching, and all this audience is standing there going, well, that's not what I believe. Well, that's not what we're teaching the people. And they were upset. And so we see in this particular passage four different things that I want to share with you today that, that have to deal with courage. And the first one is the occasion of courage. Now, you are going to come across times when you have to be courageous for your faith. And my guess is people, everybody here who knows Christ as their Lord and Savior, at one time or another, you walked away from a conversation and you, sh and you say to yourself, I should have mentioned Jesus. Oh, I missed an opportunity. You walked away from a relationship. Maybe you were just having dinner with somebody and, and the door, the, the Lord just sort of threw the door open and you thought, ooh, right now is when I should talk about Jesus. But you sort of wimped out. We've all gone through those sort of fears, right? So it takes a lot of courage to say, have you ever thought about Jesus? I mean, in the midst of a conversation. In Peter's case, he's standing in front of a large crowd and he's saying, hey, have you ever thought about Jesus? Look what happened. He, he does miracles. He gives great salvation power. He's left us with great powers and great ways to demonstrate how the gospel is true. Look at this man. He's healed. And the Sadducees were so upset that they, they threw him into jail. Now, they were brought before this Sanhedrin. It's this imposing sort of assembly. But for us, it doesn't have to be a great assembly even speaking with our dearest friends or just a few in our family, it can be an imposing time. But it's really interesting to see what happens when you mention the name Jesus. You drop him into a conversation. Uh, many times I've had the opportunity to do that. Sometimes I've backed off and I've said, oh, you know, I blew it. I should have mentioned Jesus. And other times I've been bold to step in and say, well, have you ever thought about Jesus? And sometimes it catches people off guard. I mean, if you go into the drive-thru at Burger King and you're getting your burger and she's giving you your change and you say, Lord bless you, sometimes they, they act funny. I remember I was in a car. We were in Hawaii visiting some friends. They happened to be in the Navy. He was the chaplain of, the, of Westpac. He was the head chaplain of all the Pacific Ocean. And his office was in uh, Oahu. And so while we were there uh, changing planes, we spent the day with them. And we were with his wife, and we drove on to the base. And as you check in the base, you know, the little guard station there, she's got the little sticker on her car that says she can go anywhere she wants because her husband is like this really high-up guy in the Navy. And so she pulls up, and the guy salutes the sticker because we weren't wearing uniforms. And he says, you can go on. And she turned to him and said, well, God bless you. Just, just about that fast. And his arm, you know, he's saluting. And his arm comes down, and he looks at her like, what kind of crazy nut are you? And she just drove on. Just inserting Jesus into a conversation changes people. And so sometimes you have longer stretches of time to talk with family members. To hear longer conversation over the kitchen table or on a long car ride where you get to say, hey, have you ever thought about Jesus? 
And, and when you get into those deep conversations, they may not, you know, it may not be the textbook case where they come to Christ right there, but it's a wonderful opportunity for you to share the, the hope that you have found in Christ. With so here we have Peter, and all of the disciples are there, and he's preaching, and all of these people are coming to Christ, and the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the temple are getting angry. So why do you think they would get angry? Well, he's, he's co-opting some of their power over the people, right? He's taking away some of their authority by preaching about this Jesus character do they take them and they put them in jail overnight they didn't really have anything they could hold on them i don't know if you watch detective tv shows but they'll always bring the criminals in and they always try to get information out of them before their lawyer arrives we don't really have any cause we're going to keep it as long as we can my daughter went to rwanda over uh, last christmas and in rwanda they they're pretty open with the whole COVID thing. And the way they handle it is, to get into the country of Rwanda, you have to be tested and go stay in a hotel for two days while they figure out your test. It's the long test. And once they clear you, you you're, you're good. And you can go anywhere and do anything you want in Rwanda, but, but you have to wear a mask. 24-7, anybody, anywhere has to wear a mask in Rwanda. Now, Rwanda, in fairness, is one of the only open uh, African countries, and it's because they take this great precaution. And if you're found on the street without a mask, or you're driving your car and you don't have a mask, you'll get pulled over, the police will grab you, they'll throw you in their car, and they drive you to, in, in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, they'll drive you to uh, their football stadium. They have a huge soccer stadium in downtown Kigali. And their penalty for you not wearing a mask is you get to go spend the night in the football field. And, and what they do is they don't have the jail facilities to handle it, so they just pick you up. They say, ah, we caught you. Um, get in the car. You go. They drive you. They drop you off. There's no bed, no facilities for anybody. It's just a big gate around the, around the football stadium. They, they open the gate. They shove you in. They lock it back up, and you're in for 24 hours. And so there's people wandering the football field, sleeping on the football field, whatever, but you're locked up for 24 hours before you can get back out. So no so they all wear their masks. So the, the authorities, oftentimes, in, no matter the, the age or the era or the location, the authorities sometimes don't like what we're doing, and so they want to put you in jail for 24 hours. Our world right now is really anti-gospel. I mean, we would like to think we live in a Christian nation and we have lots of freedoms and and the opportunity for sharing the gospel is there. We don't take advantage of it as often as we should, but it's there. And the reality is, if we're not careful, uh, we will let the world talk us out of our faith. Because the world is really anti-gospel right now. And so I would encourage you to speak the gospel and bring up the name Jesus in conversations that you have every day as often as you can. Talk about Jesus. Focus on Jesus and bring him into the conversations that you have. Here we have Peter speaking before so many, and, and that was his occasion. But what is your occasion for courage? It's probably not in front of 5,000 people. It's probably more likely with your neighbor. It's probably more likely with a, a work a co, a co colleague or a cohort of people in your workplace. It might be uh, somebody, a friend that you're involved with in, in a club or a group that meets regularly. Um, but that's your occasion. Make a strategy for that. Right? Begin praying for those people that you know that are not uh, really aware of the hope that can be found in Christ. Make a strategy. But, but also introduce them in conversations you have with people that are not a part of your regular routine. Just bring Jesus up in your conversations. Secondly, we not only see the, the occasion for this courage, but we see the, the secret of the, cur of the courage that uh, worked in these men and these disciples. If you look first at verses 1 through 3, as they were speaking, all of these people came out greatly annoyed. I love that phrase. That means they were ticked off because they were teaching the people and proclaiming, and they arrested them and put them away. So that's the occasion 
And that's the penalty that Peter had to pay. But look at the, look at the secret behind what, what Peter, uh, how Peter got his courage. The secret uh, that nobody else could see tangibly, but it was what fueled Peter in his understanding of sharing the gospel. And that is this. It was the secret of his courage. In verse 8, this is what it says. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, notice how uh, the writer of Acts uses that phrase, just inserts that small phrase. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you to be one of those who is, who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Great conversation uh, this last week uh, with somebody over this very topic. The idea of being under the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works in different lives, I believe, different ways. The Holy Spirit works differently with me than he does with you. Um, we believe that the Holy Spirit is part of the Holy Trinity. That he is a personhood of God. One God, three persons, and the Holy Spirit is one of those persons. Uh, there are groups in the world that would tell you the Holy Spirit is just a feeling. Uh, there are people that would say the Holy Spirit doesn't really exist anymore. He just is around when miracles take place. But, but now he's sort of left the earth. But my friend, I want to share with you, the Holy Spirit is here today working in you, bringing about the courage that you need. See, I couldn't preach to 5,000 people under my own power. I just couldn't. And I'm not afraid of people. I don't like people, but I'm not afraid of people. Well, there are certain people I don't like, but that's my issue. But if I had to preach in front of thousands of people, I couldn't really do that under my own power. Certainly, Peter, a poor, uneducated fisherman, right? He's not going to be really adept at preaching to people. So what was it that allowed him to do that? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. That kind of power is the kind of power that you and I can get in our conversations with others around us. And so as we look at, at Peter, we, we're, we're reminded of John 14, 26, where it says, but the Helper, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you things and bring all things back to your memory, whatsoever that I've told you. I have a horrible memory uh, I competed when I was in college. We, we, we worked, I worked at a summer camp. There were a number of us that worked there uh, during the summer. And we did this thing where we tried to memorize books of the Bible during the summer. And, and while we're <clears throat> running games for kids and doing music and meetings at night and all that stuff, in the, in the background, just our, our staff would try to memorize Scripture together. And there was a guy, his name was Alan Hilton. And Alan uh, was an Ortonian, by the way. And he went to uh, George Fox, I think. And then he joined us at camp down in California, and he, he was awesome. His goal was to memorize the name of every kid in camp on the first day. And so as kids begin to arrive, he would make sure he made contact with every kid. And at dinner time, one of our duties at that time, they don't think they do this anymore. I know they don't do it now uh, in the midst of COVID, but we would sit behind a counter, and as kids would come through the dinner line, we'd slop stuff on their plate. And we would sing songs, and we'd joke with the kids as they came through, and we would have a great time. And Alan, every week at dinner, he'd be the last guy in line, and every week he'd name the kids as they would come through. Every week. Phenomenal memory. We would do scripture memory, books of the Bible, and by the first, second week of summer, he had the book of Philippians memorized. It took me all summer to get to the first chapter. I mean, that's the difference. And I'm horrible with memory, but you would be amazed if you spend time in God's Word, how it'll come back to you. Um, I, I was in a conversation just the other day, and I said, you know, nobody who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. I was talking to another pastor, and we were, we were talking about people we don't like. And so I, I said that to him, and he goes, wow, that's pretty good memory of Scripture. And I said, yeah, I'm doing this journaling thing, and one of the deals is I have to sort of memorize a verse every week, and it helps. And, and in conversations with people, God will bring those things back. That's what John tells us. That's what was happening with Peter. Peter was just repeating the things that he heard Jesus say. Well, what did Jesus say? If I asked you, what did Jesus say? 
you could probably think of two or three things that you remember Jesus saying in Scripture. But if you just memorize the things that Jesus said, that kind of stuff can come back in a conversation and be very beneficial in sharing the gospel with others. So as we think about the early church proclaiming the gospel, you had Peter who was proclaiming to thousands, but there were disciples who were just sharing the gospel among people in the street and in the markets and in those places. And what was the secret to it? The secret was simply the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit, right? So the idea of walking in the Spirit is that the Spirit has control in my life. And so by His power, I'm doing everything that I can do. I think a Christian with the proper understanding knows that that's true every day of their life. When you get up, the Spirit's in control. When you go to work, the Spirit's in control. When you go home and you go back to bed at night, the Spirit's in control. That's the way every Christian should live. That's the understanding that they should have. And by realizing that, you understand the Spirit is the one that gives you the power. Gives you the power to share the gospel. So that's why we walk away from some of those conversations and we think, oh, I should have shared the gospel and I I didn't and and I should have and I feel guilty about it. Well, yeah, because the Holy Spirit gave you the power. It was there. You just chose not to use it. And so I just want to encourage you that the power that comes from the Holy Spirit is what enables you to do those things. So do it. If you're going to right live in the Spirit, then, then walk in the Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, revealing the great things of Jesus. Now, that's kind of the latter, if you think about it. The Holy Spirit in you points to Jesus. Jesus points to God the Father. See, my ultimate goal is to have a relationship with God the Father. The only way I get there is by way of Jesus. And the only way I get to Jesus is by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so allow the Spirit to fill your life to such a degree that you talk about Jesus freely. So that was sort of the secret there. We see it in in Galatians. We want to walk in the Spirit. John tells us the Spirit is there to be our helper and our guide. Ephesians 3.16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with uh, might by his spirit in the inner man. God wants us to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Allow the Spirit to work in your life. Be bold, step forward, proclaim the gospel. That was the secret of the early disciples. The Holy Spirit. The third thing we see in this particular passage is the characteristics of of the Spirit and and how uh, it worked in us and what it meant to have uh, courage. And how does courage show itself? It shows itself in in these characteristics. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Spirit, right? He's filled with the Spirit, said to the leaders, "If if you... If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. I I especially love what they say about Jesus in verses 11 and 12. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. In other words, you're the religious leaders. You should know this. But you rejected him. You should have been the first to proclaim his greatness and his glory. But you rejected him. So what he's saying here is, you let it go, but we caught it. Right? You let it slip through your fingers, but we understood who he was. And so he says in verse Twelve, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's a great verse if you're going to memorize one. There's no other name under heaven by which you're going to be saved. So there is a, a list here, if you look carefully, of the, the characteristics that come about when we are courageous for the gospel. The first one, I think, would probably I have to say is Courtesy. Notice how Peter comes in, and he doesn't try to overwhelm them. He doesn't, he doesn't get on a high thing and, and preach. He doesn't, he's just Peter. And he comes in very, very humbly to them. And he recognizes all of them for who they are and for what positions they hold. Um, 
He is before the Sanhedrin, the religious and governmental leaders of his day. And he just shares with them in great courtesy, you know, the first words out of his mouth, oh, you leaders and elders of, of Israel, right? He's acknowledging who they are. If you're going to be courageous with the gospel to your friends and to your coworkers, acknowledge who they are. Give them their due. Hey, I really respect you. I want to share something with you. Um, my mom, and maybe you've heard the expression before, you know, you can catch, you know, more uh, flies with honey than with vinegar. And boy, is that ever true. And this is that case where Peter's saying, you know, I, I know who you are. I know you're the leaders that, that rule our country. I just want you to know this man Jesus is the one. And the first words out of his mouth are acknowledgments of who they are. The second characteristic would be prudence. That, the idea of wise or judicious, you know, being discreet in public affairs, that sort of thing. He's, he's very prudent following his courteous use of their official titles. Peter makes reference to the nature of the deed done. This was a good deed. He's standing before these judges and he's saying, look, I'm standing here explaining to you about something that's good. What could be wrong with that? This was a good thing done. This man was crippled from birth and all his life and now he's well. This is a good thing. We should be celebrating this thing, he could have said. This is a wonderful thing. Let's not get upset and angry and fight over this. Let's remember what we're talking about. A healing Peter was very prudent in his approach to them, but he was also very frank as he spoke to them. Uh, he would say things like, hey, you know, these are, the way th these are the ways that things unfold. They unfold in the name of Jesus. Everything. He could have gone into a long explanation of the very breath you breathe is given to you by God. He could have said, oh, this Jesus was so supreme that you move and walk in his creation. But he didn't get that deep. He just said, look, this was a good deed, but you need to know Jesus was the one that raised this man. Look at what he says in verse 7 through 12. He says, by the, the leaders ask him, by what name? By what name do you bring this, this person healing? By what power? And Peter, again filled with the Holy Spirit, says, be it known to you, it was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, he was courteous, and, and I would have to say he was prudent, um, he, he was, but he was frank. In his frankness, he had to share with them that it was this Jesus that they had, uh, that they had done in, right? He says, this is a good thing. Good things happen because God orchestrates good things. We should celebrate that. But, but because we're here on trial, because we're here dealing with this issue, I just want you to know that it was the name of Jesus that we did this. And he could stop right there, but he said, Jesus, the one you crucified. So he was very frank with them. He was very open with them. It was Jesus, the one they crucified. Could have stopped, but he didn't. So there's fidelity as well, as well as frankness. This fidelity is that he adhered to sort of the, the detail of all that is the gospel. So he's, he's courteous, he's prudent, he's frank, but he's also got a lot of fidelity. Not only was Jesus crucified, he had been pushed to it by the very crowd that was standing before Peter asking him these questions. And so he rightly attributed Jesus' death really to this crowd. These were the offense. Uh, these were an offense to the council for it implicated them in the crime. But notice how he did it. He did it courteously, prudently, frankly, but also he held to the truth, fidelity. One of the things when we, when we start to share the gospel with people around us is we generally get afraid, scared, and, and that usually plays out in a sense of nervousness. We get nervous when, when we know we should be sharing the gospel. And so one of two things happens. One, we, we either don't and we, and we walk away, just back off and don't say anything, don't make waves, or we dive in so deep that we get sort of tangled on what we're talking about. I don't know if you've ever done that. Uh, a good example would be when people come to your front door 
and they want to share their faith with you, and you have the opportunity to speak to them, and you do one of two things. You say, no thanks, and you shut the door, or you engage them in conversation. If you engage them in conversation, may I just say this, focus on Jesus, who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, the only begotten of the Father in heaven. He's part of the Trinity. He doesn't exist anywhere else. He doesn't have any brothers and sisters who, who exist anywhere else. He is very God of God. Focus on Jesus and who he is and see how long that conversation lasts. It probably won't last very long. Because although they use the same words, many people believe different things about Jesus and different things about the faith. But if you're in a conversation around a coffee table with a friend or a dinner table with family and you bring up Jesus, I would say the same thing. Focus on Jesus. Don't get caught up in uh, how many wars Christians have started in the past. Don't get caught up on, on, on things that are happening in the news today with Christian leaders and who's fallen today and who fell last week and who's going to fall next week. Don't get caught up in that. Focus on Jesus. Because you know what? There's no other name under heaven by which you can be saved. Jesus is who you need to focus on. And if you have a good understanding and a contentment of who Jesus is in your own life, just share your testimony. Well, you may not believe, but this is why I believe. And you share what Jesus has done in, in your life. Just share, just briefly, why you believe. And see what happens in the conversation. So Peter was courageous. He had a large group of, of people. But what we see there are, are the same characteristics that we should employ in our own preaching, whatever form that takes. The idea of being courteous, the idea of being frank, the idea of being prudent, and the idea of, of being, uh, having fidelity to the truth of the matter. This is what happened to me. This is my truth. Lastly, what we see in this passage is the effect of courage. The effect of courage. You know, if you don't have courage and you don't step forward to speak the gospel to people, um, there's a great loss. There's a great sense of loss. Things don't get accomplished without courage, especially when it comes to the gospel. If you've ever rock climbed and you've been at the top, um, maybe you went up a, a little, uh, you know, free climbing with, with ropes on you is, is in a scale of 5-1 to about five, the, the real great climbers climb about 5.14, okay? I, when I was rock climbing pretty regularly as a youth, I got up to about 5.9. That was as high as I could go. That meant so, I, I could fall, somebody would catch me on the rope, and I'd be fine. But when, when we got to the top of whatever rock we were trying to get on top of, maybe you've been out to Smith Rock or, or other rock climbing places, you get up there, you're maybe hundreds of feet up. You've got to get back down. And one of the big difficulties people have in climbing is not the going up. They can keep their eyes up. They can see the next thing they're supposed to grab, and they get up there. But they get to the top, and they just don't want to come down. Because coming down means trusting somebody as you have that rope on your, uh, on your belt, and you're on belay, and your feet are against the rock, and you're just climbing your way down the rock. Somebody's basically holding you as you go. And it can be really scary. So one of the things we would do with people when we would take them out rock climbing is we would say, okay, we're going to go up the backside of this rock and we're going to get to the top. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to belay you down. So you get over that fear really quickly. And then we'll climb right back up. Well, a lot of people would get up there and they'd look and they would just bow out. I'm not going to do this. I don't have any desire to do this. You may have seen that on carnival rides or rides at Disneyland, right? They get all the way up to the front and they get in the seat and it's their turn to get in the car and then they go, mm, no, uh, I'll wait for you over there, right? They're looking at the loop-de-loops and the, you know, and they're going, I'm not doing this. And the same thing happens when they have to, you know, be blade, they get up the top, maybe bungee jumping. You know, I get all the way up there, I get laced in, I'm ready to go, mm, no, I'm not going to do this. And that happens. We go to lunch with our friends and we're sharing the gospel and we think things are going well and we're just about to kind of really dive into it and then we go, oh, no, I don't think so. 
So what you and I both need to do is we need to just pray that God would give us courage. Holy Spirit, work in me to the degree that I have enough courage to share with people what's going on. Because most of us as believers get to that edge and we go, ah, I don't think I'm going to share. And so we want to share the gospel with people. The only way that happens is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, give me that, that strength, that, that ability, because then what happens is there's an impact, there's an effect. Look at what verses 13 and 14 say in this passage at the very bottom uh, next paragraph, it says this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter, this is the people that put Jesus on the cross, right? They weren't afraid of Jesus. They, they threw him right up on the cross. But now they're looking at Peter, and they see the boldness of Peter and John and perceive that they were uneducated common men. They were astonished. Your friends, when you step across that line that says, I have enough courage to share the gospel with you, they will be on some level astonished that you're sharing that with them. They wouldn't expect that from you. You've never shared that with them before. Now all of a sudden you're sharing your testimony with them and they're astonished. The early church astonished people with their declaration, their proclamation of the gospel. So we see this in the last couple of verses. Verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed, right, the good deed that was done, they had nothing to say in opposition. What could they say? The man was healed. This was a good thing. Peter, John explained to them that it came by way of the Holy Spirit. First people, and this is what will happen to you as well, first people will, will be, they'll wonder at your boldness. They'll, they'll look at you and they'll wonder, wow, where did Tom get the courage to share that with me? They'll wonder at it. They may not respond. But in their mind, they'll wonder at it. They see you know, nothing behind it, so uh, they have to take your word for it. That's the Holy Spirit if they ask, but that's what it is. And then secondly, they not only wonder at it, but they can't speak against it. I don't know if you've ever shared your testimony before, but I've never had anybody say, you know, I'll, I'll sit down with somebody and say, this is, this is my story. This is how I came to Christ as a young man. This is what I've seen him do in my life. These are the changes that he's made in me because of my relationship with Jesus. Now I have access to the Father in heaven. It's amazing. I never would have thought when I was a young man that this is where I would be. But here I am. And I've never once ever had anybody say, uh uh-uh. uh, no way. That's not true. Because they can't. It's, it's my story, it's what God has done in my life, right? And they can't look across the table at me and say, oh, that's a bunch of hooey. No, that's my story. That's my journey. That's where God's brought me. And he can do that for you too. No, that can't possibly be. Yeah, amazingly enough, even you can be saved. Try that one on somebody sometime. And so consequently, there's this this effect. The effect is they wonder at first, and secondly, they go, oh, I can't. You know, I, know, I know who Tom is. I, I know what he's about. I, I can't really say anything in opposition to that. And you have opened the door for the gospel, for the spirit to move into their life. You have opened that door. And that's what we're here for, folks. We are no different than the early church. We're just a little bit further down the line. And our job is to proclaim the gospel. Our job is to go forth and share with people about the wonderful resurrection of Christ that we celebrated on Easter. And we're to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what do I do? I pray, Holy Spirit, empower me. Give me what I need. And I, and I know that the Spirit can do that because He's done it in my life before, right? When I came to Christ, the Holy Spirit came and, and filled me. I was, I was, the Bible terms it baptism. I was baptized right there in the Holy Spirit, right there that first time. But there have been many times that the Holy Spirit has come into my life and filled me with the ability to do something I couldn't have done on my own. Many times. So we say, as as good Baptists, we would say there's one baptism in the Spirit, but there's many fillings of the Holy Spirit. And so you and I pray that the Holy Spirit would come and fill us, that we might be able to have the courage to share the gospel with other people. That's a bold prayer. Probably the boldest prayer you can pray 
is that the Holy Spirit would come and would fill you with the ability to do things, give you the ability to do things you could never do on your own. That's it. (laughs) That's Peter's sermon in a nutshell. That should be our take on our sermon. We don't do it the same way. You're not up here on Sunday morning, but you preach to people you work with. You preach to people you live with. You preach to people that you come across every day. Are you praying that the Holy Spirit would fill you? Are you asking that the Holy Spirit would work in you? You may be a very dry desert. You may think, man, I don't even know where the Holy Spirit is. And you might be right. But as a believer, if you pray for the Spirit... God will answer your prayer. Pray that the Spirit gives you the strength, the energy, the courage to share the gospel in whatever setting you find yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love for us and all that you do by way of your Holy Spirit in us. We thank you for these early sermons of of Peter's as they teach us what it means to be effective for the gospel. Help us to share stories that can't be contradicted, but Lord, our given to us by you in our experience with you and how you lead us and teach us. So that we can share those with other people. So that they can't say, well, that's not true, or this isn't true. And we can say, well, it is true because it's my experience. Father, we pray that you would not only send your Holy Spirit to those who love you and adore you and want salvation from you and want to be a part of your family, But Lord, we would ask right now, each one of us, that you would fill us again with the Holy Spirit. That we might be able to go forth and do things under your power that we could never do on our own. Lord, as we go our way this week, make us powerful by way of the Spirit. That people around us would sense it. We know we live in a a hurting world. We know people are looking for answers. There's so much division. There's so much strife. Lord God, they want the peace that only you can offer. And so we ask right now that you would provide that for them by way of us and our courage in sharing the gospel. Help us to be a courageous people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you join us? One more song. We're going to worship together. And then I'll come up and I'll, I'll pray us out. All right, please stand.
just this morning, I, I just want to kind of have you bow your heads and close, close your eyes. We usually say that I'll be down front to pray, but I think there's probably going to be more people than I can meet with this morning. And so I'm just going to ask you a simple question. If, if you want to be effective in your conversations, if you want to have great courage to share the gospel, you know we need the Holy Spirit to make that work so that we can proclaim the great truth of Jesus. As we look at Peter and John and we, we see this account, we know that we're going to face opposition, but, but if we've got courage, then God can do great things through us. What does it take to step forward in that courage? It takes the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, I just want to ask you, if, if you'd like the Holy Spirit to come, to fill you, to work in your life, to provide courage, would you just raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you. I know some of you have great conversations with friends, with family, but you're just not as courageous as you would like to be, and the Holy Spirit can make that happen. Okay, I'm seeing hands. Good. You can put them down. I just wanted to see who I was praying for this morning. Father, we, we ask, Lord God, before we go from this place, that you would provide the Holy Spirit to come and fill not just this place when we worship, but God, to fill us, that we might have greater understanding of how courage works at and how we can courageously present the gospel. Just as Peter and John did before that great body of the Sanhedrin, our great body may just be a co-worker across the table. But Lord God, we need that courage. Provide your Holy Spirit, Lord, to prompt us, to enable us, to help us. He's the teacher and the guide. Bring back to our memory, Lord, Scripture we have learned. Help us, Lord, to focus on Jesus of Nazareth, whom we crucified by our sin, but who so graciously took it upon himself. Help us to focus on Jesus with our friends, with our family. For those who raise their hands, Lord, they're probably going to have conversations today, sometime this week. Encourage them to boldly proclaim Christ to their friends and family. Father, we love you we trust you in these things. For you are a God who can do exceedingly beyond all that we can even imagine. And so God, work in us. Use this feeble, cracked vessel to proclaim your great glory. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus. May we be like the early church. May we proclaim in your name. And as we go our way, keep us safe. But more than that, Lord, use us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, go ahead and mask up and say hi to somebody this morning before you leave. Let's take it from the bridge.